Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari. Now, as you can probably see, we have returned to Chitwa Dam because we want to give you an update. I was on the back with Tristan yesterday, so we need to update you on everything that happened. So first things first, my name's Lauren, and on camera, we do have Queen. <laughs> so back to the dam. Now, for those of you who are watching, you will have already heard Trist what Tristan was explaining yesterday. But I'm just going to delve a little bit more into it because, of course, water is one of my favourite subjects. And you're welcome to ask as many questions as you like using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or on the YouTube chat stream. So for those of you who weren't watching, just a really quick update. We did come here yesterday and the smell has not changed. Craig is struggling on the back here. Luckily, I am used to the smell. It's... <laughs> really really strong of dead and rotten fish now what we're showing you right now is the area yesterday which was just covered in dead fish which of course brought along the predators such as tingana himself and lots of scavengers like your hyenas so a lot was happening yesterday and tristan gave his explanation on what he believes has happened and i completely 100 percent agree so Oxygen is, of course, the master variable of all aquatic life. Now, we have our hippopotamus over here and crocodiles in there, of course, but they don't breathe underwater, so they are not reliant on oxygen. But your aquatic life, like your fish, are. So these hippos are basically wallowing, looking nice and innocent. So they do come out during the day, um, at night time, sorry, to eat. But during the day when they're in this water, they're actually constantly urinating and defecating, which isn't too pleasant to think about. But that's basically what they're doing all day long in the water. Now, hippos eat a fair amount, as you can imagine. It's said to be around 1.5% of the body weight which is small for a large mammal but it's still a lot compared to what we would think about probably around 60 to 8 um 60 to 100 pounds per day of what they eat so you can imagine all that food equals a lot of hippo poop shall we say so there's a lot of poop swimming in that water and in bodies of water like chitwa ammonia methane hydrogen sulfide and other sort of chemical grotesqueries if you like can build up and i believe this is what has happened here Oh, Mary Jane's saying it's very interesting. Yes, it is. It's a really hot topic. And after coming down here yesterday, I've done tons of research and finally sort of settled on my theory what has happened. But it's just building on exactly what Tristan said yesterday. So some fish in this dam will be much more resilient to ammonia than other fish. And it's actually said that catfish that are present in Chitwa Dam are actually quite tolerant to ammonia. But obviously other fish are not. So to get to the bottom of it, what I believe has happened here is all these hippopotamus have pooped and pooped a lot and their feces actually sink to the bottom of this water hole. So as the masses of poo decompose, basically um, bacteria start devouring it, if you like, and they will consume all the oxygen in the water. So the bacteria are removing the oxygen, which effectively deoxygenates this water hole. So then it causes something called hypoxia, which just means extremely low oxygen content. So it's not no oxygen. I think that would be anoxia, but it's hypoxia. So I believe in this situation, it's the hippos pooping. The number of hippos, I believe it's up to 50. I think Tristan said that yesterday. There's a lot of hippos here. Um, the level of the water, the number of fish, all in comparison to the size of the, the water body, has created sort of a temporary situation of hypoxia, which is literally choke the fish to death if you think of that it's not a nice thing to think about but the hippo poop has literally just choked these fish to death and that's why we have found them all along the shoreline now there was a lot more yesterday
So, yes, that's why I believe it has happened. Um, Giraffe Girl has asked the question, but I'm just going to wait on it being repeated. I'm sorry, it's so windy down here today. You can probably hear it. Um, so, this is most likely temporary. And believe it or not, temporary fish sort of kills can be periodic. <laughs> I am getting a question, but I cannot understand it for the life of me. We shall try one more time. So basically, Chitwa Dam has become one giant communal toilet. Are you getting it? No, me and Craig are not getting the question. I'm not sure if it's the audio, so I'm sorry, Giraffe Girl. I hope to get back to you at some point on that. So all these dead fish might sound like a disaster, and it's incredibly sad to me. However, these things do happen in water bodies, even the ocean and ponds and rivers. So it, it's not actually the disaster that we think it is, and it probably does have some benefits to the ecosystem. Well, for example, we saw last night that lots of predators and scavengers were feeding on it. So that's probably one benefit that it has. But the number of fish on the shore has completely been decimated. Me and Craig can see one or two, but pretty much I think there was a great big feast here last night. So it's all down to the hippo poop. And what puzzles me and what I'm waiting to see is the recovery so that's actually why we came back down here today just to see how the situation was the marabou storks are around but nothing else is around I'm trying to see well I think they've flown off but they definitely are hanging around the dam um, but there's no obviously predators or hyenas so in a river system they actually did a study in the Mara of a similar situation caused by the hippos. And it, this was in a river system. So once the rains come, really heavy, intense rains, that's actually able to flush the sort of hippo sewage sludge, can I call it that, <laughs> down the river. So it sort of reoxygenates the river and dilutes all the nutrients in there. So the river system will recover and the fish will be okay. But in a water hole like this, I'm not sure how it's going to go. It could be a temporary one-off event, hopefully, because I don't want to see more fish on the shoreline and the smell is just overwhelming. Or maybe we just need a really, really heavy bout of rain. It was actually raining this morning, but more of a drizzle, I would say. So maybe we need really heavy rains to come down and there won't be any flushing out because this isn't a river system, but maybe it will sort of dilute the nutrients and re-oxygenate the dam. So that is my update from yesterday. And you're welcome to ask any questions. I know Giraffe Girl did ask one, but we didn't quite get it. Um, so this is what Tingana and the hyenas were feeding on. It was, in fact, the fish. And I'm not 100% sure of all the fish that actually can be found in this dam because the person that has to go diving for it, hmm, not sure I would volunteer for it, but I believe we do find the sharp-toothed catfish the Mozambique tilapia and the red chesty tilapia. Now there is probably more barbs and tilapia in there, but again, you would either have to dive or maybe get Tristan and Brent to go fishing. Neither of which I wanted to. So those are the kind of species that we do find in the dam. So it's been very interesting research on this whole topic. And of course our hippopotami are to blame the constant poopers of the dam so the more hippos that do come here it's quite an aggregation the worse this will get so i believe this is the highest number of hippos in quite some time if i'm not wrong and 50 is quite a high number of such large animals for this uh, relatively small water hole it's obviously bigger than all the other ones but it's not a huge body of water for all those large mammals yes hippos we hear you we hear you Stop pooping. <laughs> so excess nutrients can always cause problems in ocean basins, river systems, and of course, any body of water. And that is what has happened. Too much nutrients from the hippos. 
So that was just an update for you. We might try and see if we can find anything else around Chitwa, and if not, we will move on. But for now, let's go across to Steve with another water-related animal. Well, thanks, Lauren. We are not far from where you are now. As you can tell, we have found some waterbuck. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just down the path where these waterbuck have come along. We would get to Chitwa watering hole, probably about maybe a kilometer or so, half a mile, not too far away. And as we know, the waterbuck are never too far away from that favorite drinking area. They're venturing further and further afield these days due to the beautiful green thicket grass that is all around us. Such a pretty lady, isn't she? They are definitely one of the most, one of the prettiest of the antelope, I think with their very thick, shaggy fur coat. Enormous nostrils trying to smell the air for the presence of danger. You can tell behind her and on her fur how windy it still is. A little bit skittish, these animals, due to the wind. So they're standing very, very still, trying not to be detected. Her nose is moving constantly trying to detect the slightest of movements. My ears scanning left and right, and trying to hear the approach of any predator that might try to sneak up on them. Lovely ears, eh, Seb? Mm. Well, they're not the biggest of the ears in the antelope world, but if you compare them to ours, they are enormous. And with the hair inside, adds that muffling sound, so that they're able to distinguish between particular sounds. Very pretty. Mmm, deja vu. You would like to brush this female. Well, I'm not sure you'd be able to get close enough, but you definitely have to give your your brush a very good wash with some sort of oil repellent because after you brush her your comb will be covered in a thick sort of layer of oil that will be water insoluble so it will repel any water that you might have if you like that sort of thing well there we go but she does look like she needs a bit of a brush this beautiful lady who's staring at us there oh she just gave us a tongue look at that Hello, Colleen. Lions and leopards most certainly do eat waterbuck. I have found a pride of lions with two waterbuck. And uh, I've also found Tundi not far from here last year with a young waterbuck. Do you remember that, Seb? That was um, yes. that same time when I got stuck in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a different time, but the same area. We had Tundi with the young waterbuck. Um, I haven't seen Hosanna with one, um, but I've seen many lions in the past with waterbuck. And um, they are, a lot of people say that they've got the smell. Um, the smell is derived from the oil on their skin and the gland that they give off to keep their fur dry. But that lions aren't picky. They see an animal, they eat it. I mean, if you were with us the other morning with Osana eating those rotten impala legs, that was well past its sell-by date, and yet they were still eating it. So a little bit of a musty smell on some fur is not going to deter lions at the least. There we go. She's finally calmed down and has decided it's a good time to have a little munch. They're very large mouth parts, as you can see, and waterbuck are regarded as bulk grazers feeding on a large amount of, of vegetation, uh, grass vegetation. Bulk grazers like buffalo and like zebra, but being a very similar sort of idea to that of the buffalo. You see he's getting the juiciest of the grass. It's growing just off the termite mound there. Even this time of year, all the grasses around have got the most nutrients in them. But the ones that are growing on the termite mound are well, the juiciest and most nutritious and animals will select them. Um, often you'll find in the later dry season or in the early dry season when the grass is less available, they'll be exclusively feeding on the termite mounds. But now for this time, she's feeding on it even though there is an abundance. You can see all around, lots of greenery. She's got a second waterbuck with her, both looking in different directions. 
the wind is coming from behind them folks so they're hoping to detect the smell of anything while looking in the other direction that is something you find animals do a lot in the daytime uh, sorry in the nighttime when they can't see turn their back to the wind so as they can obviously detect predators Mel, that's a great question about them shedding their fur. I've never noticed it. I'm sure they lose uh, a, 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 probably a large degree of their fur, but I've never known them to have what we call a winter or summer coat that you find in, in many of the southern northern, um, northern hemisphere animals. Uh, Waterbuck always look quite shaggy and quite furry like this. They don't, as I'm aware, lose the fur, go through two coats. Um, but I have no doubt that they do lose some fur, but they don't shed it the way that you would have elk or deer in the northern hemisphere going from a winter to summer coat. Always very shaggy indeed. I just heard something over there, Seb. I think it was a squirrel. I'm just having a quick listen, folks. You just... No, those are birds. That's not a squirrel. The wind is blowing just towards us now, so you can you can actually smell. It's like a, it's a musty, sweet smell the water bucks have, derived from that chemical or sort of that oil in the fur. And she's very interested in us. There we go. What are we looking at? See it? Her lovely legs. Yeah. Aren't those lovely legs? Well, the water bucks love wet environments. They love it. They're always very, very close to water. And not only in South Africa, but up in the Masai Mara, water bucks are like James, driving in the wet. Hello, everybody. I do apologize for our absence from the show. We've had some communication issues. The weather is foul. And we're driving now towards where the sausages were seen with four tiny baby little small minuscule cubs this morning. Four of them, this big. And we're hoping they're out. I think it is a vain hope, to be honest, because of course the weather is inclement in the extreme. And so I think they're probably hiding. But maybe they aren't. Maybe we'll be very lucky. They were spotted by Adam Bannister, who works at and Gama Mari does all their social media and stuff and he said to me that he thought that they were probably moving dens and that's why he found the Aldonia then the youngsters came up and he thought that the mother was moving them because the picture he showed us was of the mother carrying the baby so naturally the one morning we didn't come down here because of the weather we missed out anyway we're going to try now, and I know Isaac is going to try again tomorrow morning if we don't get lucky today. We've got a, probably about, I'm going to say, 40 minutes left of light. So we're going to just keep going along here and see if we don't get very lucky, which would be great. I'd love to see those tiny little babies. As I've said to many of you before, they are, in my opinion, the cutest things out here. I can't tell what this weather's going to do, whether it's going to continue to bomb on us or whether it's going to get a little bit better. Every so often it lifts and then another little squall comes through and takes us. Ah, now some of you are asking about my fashion choice. I think that's a valid question. I do have a new jacket. It is a relatively waterproof jacket, which is extremely unusual uh, to find anywhere, I've found, but especially in South Africa. I tried to find a green one, a more appropriately bush-coloured one, but I failed, and I thought, you know what? I'd rather be a little bit bright and dry than khaki, camouflaged and wet. And so you'll find that I am wearing a bright red jacket, which is, uh, well, it's not what you're going to see uh, on a list of things to bring with you to Africa. Bright red. So I apologize for glare. It's just the way it goes, you know. Now we are into the area known as the Kampia Mungu, which means Mungu camp. I don't know what Mungu means. What does it mean? Hmm? Koki. 
sorry. God. God's camp. Huh, there we go. So, we're into the place called God's camp. I can see why it's called that, because this is one of the most beautiful parts of the Masai Mara. Bungay is on camera, by the way, also on translating duty today. And I can see entirely why the Sausage Tree Pride has chosen to live down in this area. It is starting to look rather more inclement again, which is unfortunate in the extreme. I'm going to hopefully not get stuck. I like to get stuck. for some time. Rosalind, the animals get the wet season in the only way that they can, and that's by getting wet. Luckily, it doesn't ever get freezing cold here, and so, you know, they shake themselves off and get on with it. Normally, in the very wet season, in the long rain, it comes a storm every afternoon, a few storm, and then it clears up again. So, you know, the animals dry off. They'll go into thick bush if they can. I don't suppose the elephants mind too much actually where they are. But, yeah, they just cope with it. They cannot do anything. You need Oh, all right, sorry about that. You're having some bad signal with us. I'm not sure who we're going to. I think we're going back to Steve in South Africa. We'll try and sort out the problem. Welcome back to Juma. Oh, we just lost it. I'm going to see if we can get it again. We do apologize about the breakup in the Mara. Uh, bearing in mind, folks, we are producing a live internet experience for you from all over the world. Or should I say from the Mara in South Africa. We just had an African hoopoe there. It was busy walking in the road. And of course, as soon as you came to us, there he goes. He's just there. I'm going to move up a little bit more. And I think he might come back into picture. We're just allowing gravity to move us forward. We have not moved into an electric vehicle, which would be why it's so quiet. Uh, he's gone again, Seb, unless you can see him. There was an African hoopoe, one of the coolest birds around. The beautiful big crest on the top of the head. Whoop, 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 whoop. I'll obviously show you a quick picture for those of you who haven't seen a hoopoe before. Um, just quickly need to open my app there. Beautiful bird, long straight beak, which they use for probing the ground, almost like a, a knitting needle or sewing needle, a machine doop, 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 in the ground, looking for all sorts of insects underneath the ground. A very, very specialized feeding strategy. Of course, oh, hang on. Of course, they are a bird that occurs here all year round. And uh, because they've got a specialized feeding strategy, they are able to do so. There we go. You can see the hoopoe. Oopsie. You can see the hoopoe with its uh, head raised, its crest raised, because it's here. <laughs> That's helpful. Our, um, our roof has just fallen down and is covering the front. That's why we suddenly got some nice shade. <laughs> do apologize about that. But <laughs> we, are, we are sailing today. But that beautiful straight curved beak, the hoopoe will walk around and pick insects off the ground quite easily. But because they're able to, to poke into the ground, they are able to uh, then, well, it just looks like we're closing shop today. Because they're able to poke into the ground, they're able to access food in times when there's no food available. And when we've had rain, the rain will push insects a bit close to the surface. The hooper just walks around, very fast knitting needle type sort of posture, and then obviously gets the food out. So now Seb and I are obviously going to have to try and uh, fix our roof here. The technical issues that happen here in Druma. It's not a huge technical issue, we just need to tie it down. But while we sort out our roof and get ready to sail on with the wind once again, let's go to Lauren, who passed this just a moment ago. She's heading to Milvelsook. So we, oh, the sun is very bright today when I look into that camera. We are also currently looking for animals. We left Chitwa. The smell was hugely overpowering. Craig is very happy that we left. 
Um, we did just go to check up on the situation there to update you on how it went from last night. We might pop by later because as the sort of sun goes down and it gets a little bit cooler, I wonder if any of the predators joke scavengers might come back and see if there is any fish to catch. They're not really catching them, are they? Fish to eat. So it was a hugely interesting situation for me. So that's why we did pop into Chitwa. But now we're just heading north and we are going to check on Buffalo's Hook. Now with this heat that we are experiencing right now, it's very sticky. So I do believe there will be animals traveling to water sources in order to just get that little bit cooler. But other than that, we don't have any updates on any other Animals. So we are going to do our best and see what we find for you. I will. Hello, you. We do. I am looking for Ellie's. But, oh, we do have a kudu. Let's just take a look at that. We tend to just ignore the antelopes around. Oh, the male is running away. We have a male and female here together. How lovely. Now, kudu we don't tend to see too often around here. I would say they're one of the antelopes that we see the least, actually. Hello. And we do tend to sort of drive past them, not intentionally, but we do tend to sort of either just not see them or just not have the will to stop for them. But I think they deserve a little bit of attention too. Now look at their humongous ears. They're very cute and obviously they are the masters of hearing what is going on around them. Now these are pretty big antelopes so their survival strategy comes in their size. They would be hard picking for the likes of a leopard or even cheetah. I think it would be mainly the lions that would have the ability to get a kudu. A kick from one of these antelope could actually result in quite a big injury. And look at those horns. Now it causes them to run in quite a funny manner if you ever see a kudu running. They have to lift their chin very high in order to not get caught up in all the branches with these horns. Hello you. Now we actually have a lot of deer near my backyard at home and my mother's a little bit obsessed with them. We get a WhatsApp message every time she sees a deer and we just go along with it. But it just surprises me how much I think of these deer when I see the antelope. Now obviously they're not that closely related at all, but it just those big almond eyes, the body, the way they move, it just makes me think of the beautiful deer at home. Corveen is asking, what is my favourite animal in Scotland? Oh, that's very interesting. I'm actually going to continue on the journey towards Buffalo Hook while I go through this. It pro one of them is probably, well, am I allowed to say my dog? First is my little beagle, of course. <laughs> but then it is probably the deer. They are just so beautiful with their big antlers. And we actually have not too far away from us we do have some highland cows now if you're not sure what they look like they don't look like your average black and white cow they're very hairy and very distinct looking i think if many of you are unsure you probably should google it they are also awesome animals and in scotland of course we have our own dialect so we would call them the highland coo it would not be cow but obviously no one would understand me if I spoke like that, so I will say Highland Cow for now. So yeah, those are my favourite animals back in Scotland. But out here, the diversity of animals is just incredible. And the antelope species are just so beautiful. I think one of the most beautiful animals in terms of what I think is aesthetically beautiful are the impala. Even though we see so many of them per day, they are just absolutely incredible looking animals. Their big almond eyes and the color of their coat. Oh, I really like them. Oh, we have got a little bit of cloud cover here now. Oh, that's a little bit cooler for us on the vehicle. 
So yes, we are hoping to see some elephants and for those who have been watching, I have actually been... Oh! Sorry Craig, that was a bit of a bump. Been trying to link in the animals here in this area or in South Africa in general to the ocean. I know it sounds crazy, but both these realms completely interlink, interconnect. So hopefully we can find some elephants and delve a little bit more into their lineage and evolution. That's what I'm hoping for today. And if we don't find them, we'll still talk about those topics anyway. But let's just see if we can find these big animals first, which believe it or not, is quite a mission. You would think finding elephants would be a lot easier than it actually is, but with the thick vegetation growth now, it's near to impossible, unless you can hear them or see their big footprints or smell their fresh dung. Those are the keys when looking for elephants. So that's why we're traveling to Buffalo's Hook to try and see if we can see some animals having a drink or at least cooling down. I did hear a question there, but I will need it to be repeated as something related to manatees. Can you just repeat that question one more time, please? <laughs> the question, I need the whole question again. Something is related to manatees. But that's actually what we were gonna talk about. We were gonna talk about exactly what elephants were related to. I did get asked on a drive previously what they were related to. Okay, so we'll go into that a little bit. That was actually a quiz I was going to throw out there. So elephants actually have two extremely close relatives, one being a land animal and one being a, an aquatic animal. And they're as closest living relatives that it has. So I would like you guys to tell me what they are and I'm sure you probably know the lands one by now but let's see if you can come up with the aquatic animal. There's my quiz of the day for you. So we have reached the northern boundary so we're just going to turn and head towards Buffalo's Hook now and see what we can see along the way. And hopefully some of you guys are coming up with some answers for me. Oh, it's rather windy. My cap did blow off earlier, so I'm just going to keep it tight on my head. I don't want it to blow off again. That would not be pleasant. Oh, Crafty's getting the whale related to the elephant. Now I can see why you are saying that. Um, but no, it's not correct. It's not the actual animal I'm looking for. It's obviously not the land animal <laughs> and it's not the ocean one either. So let's see if we can get a few more people to guess the elephant's closest relatives. Sharon said the manatee. Well done, Sharon. The manatee is the correct ocean animal that is closely related to the elephant. Can you believe it? So I can see why people would say the whale or would think the whale, of course, but it's not. It's the manatee or the dugons, which are also very closely related, commonly called the sea cows. They're really cute animals and can be found around the coast of Africa as well. And it's really closely related to the elephants. Now, there's also a land animal. Has anyone managed to guess the land animal that's closely related to the elephant? It's definitely not what you would imagine. Far from it, in fact. And it's also found here. Now the manatees are not found here. They're of course found in the ocean. <gasps> yes, hyrax, rocks, rock hyrax. So I'm sure many of you knew that part. I just wasn't sure if you knew the connection to the manatee. So the elephants, the rock hyrax, and the manatee are all very closely related. So when you think of whales, whales are actually grouped together with dolphins and porpoises called cetaceans. And they are very closely related to the hippos. 
So those are the lineages that actually connect them to the ocean. So every animal has a link to the ocean. So you may think it's bizarre that I'm talking about this kind of stuff, but it just puts a little bit of a different perspective into things. I'm sure you've heard many interesting facts about animals. So elephants have developed from the ocean. But the rock hyrax is probably the most surprising one, to be fair, those tiny little animals. Woo! I'm not sure if you can hear the wind, but it's really, really, really strong today. Please don't blow my hat off. So yeah, that was my little quiz of today, and it seems like everybody done pretty well. Good job. Now, just the other day, we did go on a drive and we did spot a huge African rock python. From my guess, it would have been about 15 meters, probably well, uh, five meters, sorry. Five meters, 15 feet. These are, uh, it confused me, the meters and the feet. So about 15 feet, it was massive and it was just here the other day. But for now, let's send you over to Steve, I think, to see exactly what he has. Welcome back. Well, Lauren, thanks for your interesting information about elephants and dassies or hyraxes and manatees. Very, very cool. Well, we came around on the road and we found tracks of a male and female lion. Excuse me while I just jump out of the car. Sorry about that, Sip. A male and a female lion. I'm trying to count now how many there are because we've been following them all the way down the road now. Let's have a look. Let's count. So we've got to get on the right side of the light if you want to be able to see. Here is one. Okay, there's one. We've been following two. I've been quite certain of that. Here's another one. That could be the same animal. No, there's two different animals there. You can see there. There and there. There's at least two. And I think I just saw a third one. It's possible that um, those lions... There was a mating pair not so long ago, somewhere in the east, and maybe they're still mating. Maybe they decide it's time to go back to the Unkuhuma Pride, and while well, invariably that male will probably follow her to try and get a good meal. So there's at least two, and then an older track on the left. No, not that old. The wind, unfortunately, folks. The wind really makes it tricky to track in these conditions. We've been coming down the road. Have a look at my shoe. Can you see my shoe track here, Seb? Yes. The, the angles are very sharp. That is a fresh track that happened only moments ago. But with wind, you see how the wind can really mess up the angles of a track. And when it's windy like this, it makes it very difficult to know how fresh, in fact, that track was. I wasn't out this morning. I've, I've been a little bit ill the last two days, so I wasn't sure if anybody's driven this road, but these tracks seem to me like they were from last night. So we're gonna keep following. They've come all the way down the road from the east. Let's go see who it might be. That male lion we had earlier is just up here on the other side of the of the Umawati drainage. One of these might be him, because I think there's a third lion track there, and the other two might be the mating pair with one of his brothers. And it's not uncommon for male lions to follow each other, especially when there's a mating. And that's why they're so protective of their mate, because essentially they'll be walking and as soon as the other male lets her go for a moment, the other one will try to sneak in there. So it's why they don't let them go at all. They stay right behind them. As the female moves, they get up. As the female moves, they get up. So let's just keep having a look. There's lots of little watching holes dotted along the drainage up here. Um, and we know lions like water. I'm going to assume it's one of the Unkuhuma females with one of the Avoka males. It's definitely a male lion with two male, a female lion with two male lion tracks. So very likely a mating pair with that other individual who'd come in from the east. They do move an enormous distance, male lions. Uh, when they're in a mating pair, they don't move too far. Essentially, they move as far as the female sees fit. Quite often, that is not far at all. Tracks are still here. We're coming down to the Umawati. I don't know what our signal is going to be like as we get down, but
but there are some alarm calls just up ahead here. We're going to see if we can scratch around, see if we can find out what's going on. But while we do that, let's go all the way up to James Henry, who is loving the overcast rainy Mara. It's not raining anymore. Hello, everybody. I, you may hear a slight dejection in my voice. We haven't managed to find anything other than rain, mud, puddles, and quite a lot of grass. And if I'm very quiet, you can probably hear some frogs. Quite a few frogs calling. And you may also hear the pitter patter of the rain. You probably also see basically that a large cloud has come over the escarpment and we can't actually see the top of the escarpment at all. So quite apart from clearing up, it is uh, getting quite a lot more inclement, which is unfortunate. I hope we don't get stuck because A, I don't wish to be a member of the Marshmallow Club and B, I'm not sure anyone would be able to come and rescue us. <laughs> so we'd have to survive on a couple of nuts and one or two chocolate digesters uh, for dinner. Which frankly, in comparison with what we can expect at home, is just not very good. So no lions over here. I'm going to turn around now and I'm going to go south and see if we don't get lucky. Now, I don't know, many of you are asking which frog species we were hearing. I was rather hoping you wouldn't ask, to be honest, because I, I don't know. But what I can do is have a look. I've got a Southern African frog app, and I suspect quite strongly that quite a lot of the same frogs occur here. So I'll just play a few. Uh, Bunga, you really don't need to, do you want to watch me do this? You can, you can watch me do this, I don't mind. Um, there's one that is making a whistling sound, which I'm going to try and find. I've just got to turn off the location, you see, because what it's doing is finding me at Juma, which is obviously not going to help us at all, whatsoever. So now I'm just going to see if I can hear one of the... Let me just listen to one of these chaps. Play. No, not a, not a leaf folder. This is the most common one you'd hear at Juma. That's the painted reed frog. And you can hear something similar around here. And I wanted to play this one. No, they don't have the sound for that one. Mm. No, I, I'm afraid I'm not managing to find anything particularly useful on the sound sound front. I feel like I should know that one going. If anybody has any idea, it could easily be an East African puddle frog here. There are lots of lovely ones calling there, aren't there? Yeah, sounds like we've got a grass frog of some description calling around here. That's what I was playing there. Definitely, I can hear one now. A grass frog of some description. But it's that one that's going... Let's try one of these stream frogs. No. Nope. I can definitely hear a grass frog as well. Tick, 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 tick. Let me play that one for you again. I'll play you the East African one. East African puddle frog, sorry. Here we go. I can hear him. Mm. 
with me a couple of grass frogs around. There, it's that one I can't figure out. I feel like I've heard it a hundred times before, but I don't know what it is. If anyone would like to help me, hashtag spy live, of course. Or the chat stream on YouTube. All right, I think we should probably turn around now and make our way a little bit further to the south and see if we don't get lucky there. Okay, Bunga, are you happy to turn around? Yes? You are. You gave me a thumbs up. Excellent. I hope we're still with you. I'm not sure if we still have comms. We're going to do this very gingerly. As you can see, we're sort of going sideways backwards. Okay, I think we're okay. There we go. Oh, Sinak, I'm not sure what the most unique or funniest call of the African of the of an African frog is. Um, I don't know. I find them all very different and I enjoy them all very much. I suppose my favorite one, I can play you my favorite one. I don't know how funny it is, but it's, it's the bubbling casino. It's very common, but I quite like it. I'm just going to quickly get through this difficult section. Hold on tight, everyone. And then I will play it for you. Oh, we made it. Casino. Let me find you the casino. Ooh, ooh. You must never use your phone while you're driving, everybody. It's a very bad idea. Here's the bubbling casino. Isn't that nice? It's my favorite call. There are definitely some birds that make me laugh. I'm not sure how many frogs make me laugh, though. The hardy dar makes me laugh quite a lot. The Egyptian goose, when it calls, makes me laugh. Hold on, another slightly difficult bit. Definitely some puddle frogs calling here. Tick, 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 tick. I'm going to try and find you one now. Now, I'm told that the lions were around here this morning, but if she was moving her den, like I said, well, the chance of us finding them, especially in weather like this, not great. Because we cannot go off-road here. We will become stuck for weeks and leave some horrible ruts. All righty, let's go back up to South Africa, where Lauren, I think, is probably at Chitra Dam. I'm not sure. So we did find some leopard tracks. They looked relatively fresh because as I mentioned earlier, we did have some not huge rains, um, but definitely rain. So we're just gonna head up this fire break here and have a little look to see if there is a leopard lurking about. The tracks look like could have been potentially from this morning or just a few hours ago. So our mission is going to be quite difficult here amongst all this vegetation. But they were definitely coming in this way. So we had a little peek at Buffalo's Hook Dam. And there doesn't seem to be much happening there. So we're just going to check this area here and see if there is a leopard hanging around. Now obviously we saw Mr. Tingana yesterday. But it's been a few days since I've seen Hosanna. I wonder where he's hiding. Gone are the days where he was just hanging around near where our dam cam is. There was a period of about a week where he was there every single day. So those days are gone. And he's probably making the most of hiding in amongst this vegetation. So luckily I have Craig with me who is an excellent spotter up behind that camera. So the two of us are going to see if we can potentially find something.
Although, to be honest, it's cooled down a lot. I was complaining a little bit er earlier about the heat and it has really cooled down, which means those sleepy, too hot animals may get up and actually start walking around, which would be great for us. Come on, leopard, where are you hiding? Now, as I've mentioned already, it's very windy. Now, the reason I mention this again, as we saw the kudu earlier with the big, huge ears, so you can see they really use those ears to listen around for things. Now, the winds can play havoc with the animal's hearing. So there are definitely some predators that can take advantage of the fact that these animals cannot hear so well. So we live next to quarantine, which is a big open clearing, and you tend to find a lot of the antelope species will sort of congregate in the open clearing, especially on evenings and nights like this, so that they know they might not be able to hear anything because the wind is really strong, but they will be able to see. So I guess the predators can use this to their advantage if the wind keeps up like this. It plays havoc with your hair as well. There we go, that's better. Oh, we've got a little water hole here. It's amazing all the little water holes that keep popping up. And these are the perfect little water holes that leopards would come to. So we're going to keep looking for now. And while we look, we're going to send you over to Steve, who is also tracking. Well, thanks, Lauren. Good luck with your leopard search. Well, folks, we followed those tracks into the drainage. Let me just give you an idea of where we are. OK, so we found the tracks over here. And we followed them all the way down this road here into the drainage line over there. Oopsie, the wind is blowing. The other male lion is over there, just there on the junction. And the tracks sort of came out of the drainage line and they've disappeared. There was nothing on the road. Uh, there's been some rain. It's very difficult if the ground's not soft to track. But this morning in this area over here, Jamie and Seb were following up on some uh, birds in the trees, vultures and the like. They didn't manage to find anything. And, well, they also said that the tracks of this male line came from here somewhere. Came from sort of Philemon's dip area down. So it's a good chance that these two are probably two of the other evokers with a female, and he doesn't even know where they are. They might be very close to each other, but we're just going to come around here and see if we can find any tracks coming in and out, because you never know. We might be lucky. It is that time of day. It has cooled down a whole lot and we might be lucky with some animals moving. We're going to the area. We already did a loop around the block where they had the vultures this morning. There was nothing in there that we could see. We couldn't see any tracks, but it's so very thick. Seb almost brought the drone out this afternoon to fly into that block so that we could find anything that might be on the ground. But when we did drive around, all the vultures are gone. That's normally common practice when it's very windy. The birds of prey don't normally stick around too long in the trees. They quite enjoy the wind because it helps them to fly, to gather some speed. And uh, also it's hard to hold on when it's very windy. There we go, talking about birds of prey. I don't know if you're going to be able to get him, Seth. There's a battalier up in the tree there. Sorry if we do happen to catch the roof in the shot. There's the battalier eagle. Juvenile. Oh, thanks, Anna Marie. I love to show the map. I think it's quite nice for people to get uh, Marie. It's, I think it's nice for people to get an idea of where we are. Now you can tell the wind direction by looking at the bird. You can see the clouds are blowing in the same direction, and birds will always position themselves in a tree facing the wind because obviously they can hold on that way. And if they want to fly, they just jump, and the wind picks them up, and off they go. Um, I saw this guy a little while ago in the block and I walked in to see if I could find something, but he flew off. Battleers are a very good indication of food, very good indication of meat, but I think there's a little bit of alarm calling going on up there. Seb, do you hear that? Mm -hmm. I think it might just be that bird that's next to him. There's another bird on the branch. There's a couple of them, in fact, a few starlings that are not very happy with the presence of the eagle. 
Oh, my mistake. That is a brown snake eagle. You can, I'm looking with my binoculars, you can actually see the eye is yellow. And it's very tricky. We've got a very puffy head, brown snake eagles. And they are brown in color, of course. And they have no feathers on the legs. My mistake, I saw a little white band on the wing, thinking it was a, a, um, a battler, but you could just make out the yellow eye there. Brown snake eagle, well known for catching small reptiles and snakes. Of course, as the name implies, not only brown snakes, folks, whatever snakes they can come across. And maybe the birds are angry because there are snakes around, or maybe they're angry because the eagle is there. It is a breeding time for most of our birds, and so any raptor or any bird of prey or any, uh, any predator, in fact, is often dealt with quite quickly. He's decided he's going to have a little bit of a preening session up there. You see how he's trying to hold on. The wind is really fluffing its feathers. Almost like boats on the lake. And you can tell which way the wind is blowing. The direction the boats are facing is generally the direction the wind is coming from. Very good, beautiful sky. Not as overcast it seems as the Masai Mara. Wonderful gray backdrop. Beautiful image of a brown snake eagle perched beautifully in the tree. Okay, well, we're going, to, we're going to carry on. Within this block somewhere is where apparently there might be some lions. But barring that, we're going to go back and check on the evoker male, who I have no doubt is probably in the same place. There's a pretty quiet afternoon out in Drum. It's myself and Lauren. And uh, there's no one else. How fantastic is that? So, you know, I've done some studies in the past, and obviously the more vehicles out, the more animals you're going to find. It's just kind of logic, isn't it? But you can go out there on your own, and you can be quite lucky. But one vehicle on a large property, the chance of you finding too much is quite slim. We use the radio so as to expand our search to be able to take as much time spend as much time out and spread out. Alex, you want to know about stiletto snakes? Snake eagles will eat any snakes, really. The stilettos are burrowing snakes. They're not generally found on the surface. Uh, every now and again, they might be, but they'll go for any snake, really. They're not, not too fussed by snakes. Um, sometimes, though, they get bitten and they die. But uh, they do have a very good ability of catching snakes. Obviously, if you are a snake and your head is here, the rest of your body is very vulnerable. So birds of prey just grab them there. I mean, most of us can, can grab a snake if you've got the, the speed and the confidence to just try grab it. It's a very commonly known way of catching snakes. Uh, but the stiletto snake or the burrowing asp has got the ability to turn and bite. But I don't know if that would actually hurt the snake eagle because their feet are well armored. There's very, very thick sort of skin, leather-like skin on the legs of snake eagles, designed just for that purpose. But if the snake happens to, if it catches in the wrong place, it rears up, well, and there's a good chance it might catch some envenomation. And well, there's nothing it can do in that case. Oh, there's our lovely three-lobed hyena that always uh, catches us out. Ooh, a little Daka running through the thickets there. Just disappeared. I don't think you can get him, Seb. Is he gone? He's gone. This is Tingana's haunt, folks. This little drainage line where I had Tingana catch that warthog in the burrow not so long ago. Well, actually months ago now, it seems. I was still here before the Mara. So that was July, August. Wow. Where has the time gone? Where has the time gone? Okay. Well, we're going to look around just around the corner and see if we can find any signs of predators in the block south of where we have to always have Tingana. In the meantime, James has got a nocturnal predator. Righty, here we have an ool, as David Gatambagitu would call it. It is a giant eagle ool, or the Varose eagle ool. Sitting atop the Balanites tree 
looking for things that it might catch in the night. I actually saw a picture today, and that picture was of what looks like a giant eagle ool, like this one, taking a white-tailed mongoose, which I would have thought much too big for an ool like this, but apparently not. And so any mongoose that are knocking about here in the grass, any other rodents, perhaps some, uh, even, I suspect something as big as a black-bellied bustard, if it was asleep in the grass here, would be fair game for this ool. Hello, yes, we are talking about you. You look a bit dishevelled, to be honest. I think that you have got a bit wet, and if I were you, I'd be in a thick, green, leafy tree, not sitting out there in the open. Perhaps you're a rebellious teenager and you don't care. This is the James Dean of uh, ools. You can also see his tremendous talons in the bottom there of his legs. Huge. I think they must be three inches long at least. He reminds me slightly of my brother. Now, I don't <laughs> doubt my brother's watching. I'm sure he's at work still. So. Uh, but he, my brother looks a little bit like a giant eagle ooh when his hair is wet like that. That's <laughs> quite funny. Monique, you want to know how tall he is when you say he looks so tall? Yeah, they are quite tall. They're about, I think they're about two and a half feet tall. Let me check, maybe not quite that much. I'm going to check for you exactly how tall they are. How do you spell ooh, do you suppose? Right, the Rose Eagle Ool is two feet tall, 62 centimetres on average. The male weighs 1.7 kilograms, which is, um, what's that, about, I don't know, just under two pounds. And the female weighs 2.3 kilograms, which is quite a lot heavier, just over a pound. Sorry, just over four pounds. Five pounds. Female is five pounds, male is four pounds. Bubo lactius is what it's called. I think that's rather a nice uh, Latin name. Bubo lactius, sitting in Balanites Egyptica. Now let us just quickly do a little bit of researches on the food. Hunts mainly by night, yes, yes, often from a perch, yes, that's good. Often near a game trail or open riverbed, well, not so much here. Now, apparently, they also eat yellow-billed ducks. That's quite interesting. They'll eat anything from termites, beetles, warblers, half-grown vervet monkeys, secretary birds, warthogs, warthogs, piglets, sorry, warthog piglets, and capable of flying while carrying 1.8 kilograms. Now, I would have said that that mongoose had caught yesterday and then flew off with must have been in the region of three kilograms, so possibly even higher than that. Interesting. A lot of you are wondering if it can turn its head 360 degrees. No. No, no bird or owl especially can turn their heads 360 degrees. They can turn their heads pretty close to 270 degrees though. And the reason they're able to do that is obviously they have very flexible um, vertebra. And they also don't cut off circulation to their brains. They have a mechanism by which the jugular is kept open. And so if you turn your head, you'll suddenly find that it can't breathe very well. Whereas the owl does not have the same experience. Many birds are able to do this. It's not just ooze that are able to do it. Ooze just look like they're doing it more effectively than others because they, I guess they just have heads that look like tops. You know, if you watch a hornbill doing that, it's not that impressive, but when an owl does it, it just looks that much more impressive. But if you watch a hornbill, for example, cleaning its back, it turns 180 degrees round very easily. Oh, excuse me. Lauren, you're wondering about ear tufts and what their purpose is. I think they're largely decorative. They are not, not the ears, obviously. The ears are nowhere near what we call the ear tufts. 
And so, you know, they don't have any function in hearing. And I don't know that they actually have a biological function further than uh, it's the same kind of thing as why do, why do magpie shrikes have long tails, I think. I'm not sure. I'm happy to t be corrected on that. But the ears are not near the ear tufts. They're, un they're much closer down the cheeks, much further down the cheeks than the ear tufts. It might help, I suppose, with uh, focusing the sound into their faces. You can see their dish-like faces. Most obviously, you see it on a barn owl, which does focus sound and behaves a little bit like a satellite dish and allows them to locate their prey using sound. Maybe it helps with that, but I don't, it doesn't look like it does. It just makes it look like my brother. I suppose technically they could turn their heads 360 degrees, actually, if I think about it. They can't turn them all the way around, but he could look over his back, almost entirely behind him, and then turn around and look the other way, all the way over his back, just about. So, yes, so almost 360 degrees. Whenever people ask that, they, I always think, well, do they mean, can he sit where he is now and turn his head 360 degrees back to where it is now? And the answer would be no. The thunder continues to roll, the clouds continue to settle on our heads. And I'm afraid we're going to give up on these lines now. It's got too dark. We'll start making our way back towards the north of the Masi Mara. And maybe we'll see some other ooze on our way. On we go. Goodbye, ool. I hope you catch something tonight and your feathers aren't too wet. It's looking at us now. What is that? Colour. Oh, we've come back to colour. Onge, what do you want me to say? Oh, we're in infrared, everybody, in case you're wondering. We're now stuck because I was distracted. Oh dear. Right. <laughs> All right, now we're going to try and get past this little rather difficult spot. There we go. We've made it, Bungay. Don't worry. Um, Sinek, the most beautiful owl for me, probably the Pell's fishing owl. The Pell's fishing owl is a stunning owl. Oh my goodness gracious me, this is not looking good for us. It's a beautiful russet colored owl, catches fish. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're almost onto the main road. Phew. Phew. Okay, you all right? He is grinning, which is good. So I think the Pell's fishing owl, my favorite owl, I'm not gonna try and show it to you on my phone. Unfortunately, it's raining a bit too much for that. But they have gorgeous russet color with little black sort of diamond shaped dis um, decorations. I like them. Owls are normally quite dull, really, because of course they are night hunters and nocturnal mostly. And so there's no real point in them being bright or colors. Beautiful river. This this is the one with the sausage tree pride. Spins a lot of their time. So we will. I just get. All right. Let's go back across to Steve. I believe our signal isn't so hot. Welcome back, folks. We did a loop around. Didn't manage to find any tracks crossing both roads into that block where there was apparently some form of kill this morning. No one really found it. All we had, or all Jamie and Seb had, was some vultures. 
But uh, we've decided, you know, why not? Let's come and have another look at this evoker male who has now moved close to the road for a beautiful shot. How's that, Seb? Yeah. Here we go. I'm just going to let everybody know that he is still in the same place. If you just give me a moment to talk on the radio. The station's relocated on the Evoca Mail, same place, one station on lock. So now everybody who is out there, not that there are many people, have the potential now to come and have a look. Because uh, when you've got a large property to traverse, if you have to look in every nook and cranny on your own, it can take a very long time to find what you're looking for. But when it comes to tracks, for example, we found those tracks of that at least three lions walking. If you've got someone else who's out helping you, they can kind of minimize the search area by helping you check roads, check areas, check accesses, and then together as a team, you can find what you're looking for. Well, this guy is not in a team at the moment. He's normally in a coalition of three males, the Uvoka males. One of his brothers has been in a relationship for the last little while, I don't know which one i haven't been able to identify the three brothers yet since i've been back i've only seen one on their own and now another one the other one i saw was mating with what i thought was amber eyes i didn't get any confirmation on that but isn't he just so cute he is very hungry though folks you can see how <laughs> empty his belly is that is a hungry lion put 50 odd kilograms in there some books I've read say 36 kilograms, some say 50, so that's 70 to 100 pounds. Regardless of which number is right, it is an enormous amount of food. And a hyena can only put about maybe 25 pounds, sorry, no, about 30 pounds in their belly. There we go, he's up. There was some impala coming down very, very nonchalantly down to the little watering hole to come have a little drink. It seems as if he's moved out a little bit to the open. He doesn't have as much cover as he did. And the wind is blowing in the direction he's looking. So I don't think you've got much chance of hunting in that direction, sir. Maybe he's been searching for his brothers. Seeing male lions come together after a bit of separation is always very special. These enormous beasts, strong, powerful, animals when they suddenly meet each other again it becomes an, a really incredible little love affair once again as they rub and roll and touch and caress it really is quite a special thing to see and it's that strengthening of bonds that they have although they will compete with each other over the females that are in estrus it will never be a fierce fierce competition to the eyes of someone who is not a lion it looks very very fierce but it is not that fierce uh, when they encounter other males not of their family or not of their coalition that's when things can get very hairy chick chick you would like me to name the evoker males i'm afraid that's out of my hands um, it is something i think that's being spoken about but um definitely the, the likes of james and uh, also the leading guides on the property will be responsible for the naming of them uh, it's not a process that i'm going to get into right now but it is something that i know sometimes we like to get or many of the time we like to get the viewers involved in uh, but for now it is not what we are going to do i do apologize chick chick but it will happen no doubt once we get to see them more regularly they'll definitely get names no doubt it will be some local local name that describes their behavior describes something about them. Seb, I'm just going to move up a bit so we can get his better side. He's decided to finally pick his head up, but he's now looking in the wrong direction. Well, he's a wild animal, folks. He's not going to do what we need him to do. We just give him the space he requires, move around him. He's looking quite solemn, I must say. He's probably wondering, where, oh, where are my brothers? Tell me when you're happy, Seb. There we go. That's much better. He is a beautiful, beautiful lion. I remember when I left here in September, um, I think the last time I saw the Evoca males, they didn't have a full mane. Only one of them was really looking quite big and strong. 
Uh, but now this one and the one I saw the other day with the mating pair, both have got a full mane. And it's quite incredible how the mane development can actually increase once male lions form dominance and form a coalition and access a territory. It, uh, they, they suggest that a lot of the developments of the mane comes from testosterone and testosterone is obviously increased and uh, pushed around the body during aggressive acts and through fighting. And when male lions do interact and fight with other male lions, even if it's just with themselves, and uh, that testosterone builds up, and one oh, goes that hardy da ibis flying over. He just went, oh my word, there's a lion there. And off he went. So they reckon that male lions will reach a certain main development at a certain age, normally between about two and a half and three and a half. And then once they form some form of dominance, um, and they go, get into some fighting and battles, suddenly that mane really kicks in with the increase in testosterone in their body. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the science behind it, but it makes a lot of sense because suddenly out of nowhere, in with a couple of months, these guys went from having scraggly manes to looking like the king of the jungle. Look at him, there's a few wounds on him. And that characteristic little mark on the lip should make him easily identifiable. Male lions, unfortunately, are constantly changing their face due to the competition that they go through. Every time you see them, they've got new marks, new scratches, new scars. You're most welcome, Dave. He's just here south of me. Yeah, everyone's saying he's looking a bit lonely. Well, you know, lonely lion, what can you do, poor fellow? Um, he's looking hungry and lonely and uh, no doubt maybe if we have time this evening we'll hear as it starts to cool a little bit we might hear him giving off a contact call or even his brothers giving off a contact call and those tracks folks were not far from here but unfortunately as they just went off the road there it just became very difficult to track because when it rains the rain makes the ground very very hard and well a lion walking with their very soft foot on this very hard ground makes it almost impossible to see where they've gone to but no doubt we're hoping anyway this evening we'll be able to see exactly where the others might be uh, the two males seemingly with one female the tracks suggest that, that was the case and from Seb's information this individual came uh, from the northwest Maybe it was one of those males that was following the mating pair and it did a big loop and came all the way back. It's hard to say, really. But what we can tell you for sure is we are with the hungry, lonely male lion of the Avoca Coalition sitting right next to the road. And hopefully we'll get some calls and some noises out of him shortly. It's not far from a little pan of water had a few animals bravely coming down to drink earlier maybe some more will do so male lions are very good hunters in their own right often being nomadic for years sometimes on their own having to provide food for themselves they are the best scavengers around because they can just chase anybody off of food a male lion running into a situation is never too afraid of anybody <coughs> didn't get that name zebra you want to know if lions look bigger on screen than they do in real life well zebra I'll tell you one thing the lions look relatively large when they are sitting on the ground even on screen even in real life but when they walk right up to the car and they walk right past my leg that is when they really really look enormous but they are beasts they are really really big animals they can get up to about 500 pounds I mean, that is enormous. Can you imagine a human being of 500 pounds? And they don't stand that tall. They're quite long, I'd say, but it's all muscle. Bone density and muscle. There's no fat on them at all. Oh, there we go. That was hard work. Such hard work. He's also got a quite nice, little, easy, easily recognizable double spot on his lower eyelid there. So no doubt, folks, in the coming weeks or coming months, there will be more discussions about the naming of these individuals. Um, sadly, it's not going to be me today. 
there's a bit of a process that we go through so as to get a lot of participation involved in and everybody gets a bit of feedback obviously the Juma guides need to be involved the viewers we love to have your involvement as well of course it is your show after all so we have got a vehicle that has just joined us of course as you heard me calling them in they are sitting just behind us and they're quite excited to be seeing this big male lion and their gasps are also like how big is he but a male lion lying in the grass it never looks as threatening as it does when night falls and i remember the one time being with the evoker males just up the road from here and all three of them stood up started roaring right next to the car and then one by one filed right past my leg i tell you it doesn't matter how many times that happens it is still quite sort of bone chilling because at night their eyes change shape their pupils dilate and become well they become enormous and they just take on a completely different edge to themselves you might hear some ox peckers flying overhead there might be some buffalo hanging around in the drainage. We might see if our male does anything soon, and if not, we'll go see if we can find something else. Chi Chi, I am shaking internally when they walk past me, um, most definitely, but I don't move when the lion walks past the car. Their heart definitely skips a little bit of a beat. It never gets old never never gets old especially if they stop and look at you their eyes go straight through you and i've done this for years i've had lions close to the vehicle for years but there's nothing quite like that look a lion gives you when it stops right next to your car looks straight into your eyes and you're just trying to think what is going on in that animal's brain what is it thinking right now and they say the true sign of a man is to be able to stand your ground on foot eye to eye with a male lion that is a testament to becoming an adult in many african cultures a lot of that is changing due to the limitations that most african cultures have with the wilderness these days and most of the wildlife has been removed from areas that they once roamed freely and so a lot of those old traditions are being lost but I've no doubt the Mara, the Maasai, still have certain traditions like that. They still live very intimately there with their animals, living in the landscape with their cattle as well, obviously. You need to be able to protect your cows. And the biggest threat to the Mara cattle is indeed lion. Well, we're going to stay here with this lion for a little bit longer. But in the meantime, no doubt James up in the Maasai Mara can enlighten us more about what God is on up there. Righty, we've left the sausage tree pride area. We might find some of the pride on the hunt. Not sure. Anyway, the rain continues to come down. It has not topped and lifted. It did last night for a while, but no, not today. It's just carried on. At least it's not that hard. We can still keep moving. So I'm afraid I don't have a huge amount of biological value to tell you at this stage other than I'm pretty sure Kinky Tail herself will also soon give birth. And then there are going to be more than just the four very little ones. Interesting that they're four, and I think it's probably quite unlikely that all four will survive. But it would be quite nice if they did. I've never seen a litter of four make it to independence. In fact, I'm not sure I've seen a litter of three make it to independence. I'll shine the spotlight a little bit, it's going to get wet though and then I'll have to put it away. Anyway, that's the state of play out here in the Marcy Maro. It's supposed to be dry season now. But it has failed to be dry season. I do seem to have spent an inordinate amount of time out here in the rain, as have we all, of course. Who can ever forget the possibly one of the most classic sightings we've ever had of two presenters, Jamie she was presenting at the time and uh, Taylor in fact I think that neither of them were presenting they weren't live and Taylor a little uh, <laughs> jump over a little 
little gully and she fell straight on her face and it was very amusing. Apparently Jays are blue, is that what your name is? Jays are blue. Uh, my jacket looks better in infrared. Well, I'm very pleased it looks good in infrared. It's probably got something to do with its redness. It is certainly a very red jacket. some frogs on the road. There's something on the road in front of us. Is it a frog? Oh, Welcome back. Terribly sorry about James's signal up in the Mara. We are still here with our male lion again apologies for any bad signal up with james sometimes the thunderstorms and the rain can really impact that is nothing that i truly understand i can tell you most things about lions and the plants but when it comes to how exactly the internet and the connection works on these vehicles well that is where <laughs> the other guys come in well seb i think has a much better understanding than i do but i really am not going to pretend to understand it all. All I know is some things really do affect it, like this time of year here in Juma. The thickness of the bush really does impact on the signal. Certain areas that in summer we get great signal and in winter we get well, in summer in winter we get great signal and winter we get apps summer we get absolutely nothing. Sorry I'm getting very caught up in my words here. Well he's done nothing at all. I don't know if he's going to move much but I'm sure in the next probably what five minutes before show end he's going to get up give us a bit of a roar and off he's going to go what do you think seb yeah i agree seb agrees that's how the evokers normally work but i must be honest the wind has really cooled things down it is a lovely afternoon compared to the last few days that we've been having you might just hear a vehicle just starting up the landowner vehicle behind us is in us with the sighting they're going to be moving off i think or repositioning for another view of this very flat cat. Please don't forget to keep your questions and comments coming through the hashtag Safari Live or throw them in on the YouTube chat stream. Hello Bone Crusher Queen, that's a great question about the mane. The mane to me on him, he looks like it's almost fully developed. Uh, if anything, it might get darker. That's something that will change. Um, it's also a genetic thing. Some male lions don't get black manes. It gets about that darkness of rouge, that dark reddish brown color. It doesn't get too much more than that. Um, but some males will go black. Um, and that is def often a testament of age and also testosterone. Uh, but it all depends on who the fathers were. You might find fully grown male lions uh, that have got no black at all in their mane and some that never develop a really big mane at all. Uh, there are records up in, I think in Serengeti, or Mara it might be, of a maneless lion many years ago. I think it was in Kenya, Tsavo. I think the man-eating lions of Tsavo were actually maneless lions. And it's possibly a reason why they became man-eaters, because they weren't really accepted into lion society. But that is a story that I'm not too familiar with. I do know that it is a true story. In the movie, The Ghost in the Darkness is obviously a little bit of a play about it. You see some vehicle tires moving there. See how it doesn't influence this boy at all. So the mane is a genetic thing, just like tusks in elephants. Uh, some elephants get big tusks, some get small. But definitely the size of a mane in a male shows their age. But some of them will never get a dark, thick mane. Some will always just be a little bit less, but that all depends on who dad was. They're sleeping with one eye open, Seb. Mm. Lovely eyelashes. Twitchy ear. Well, we'll be left alone again now, folks. So any questions or comments you might have about the evoker males or lions in general? Battalier in the distance there flying, Seb. He's doing a little bit more excitement than um, this lion is for now. A very characteristic flight pattern of the battalier. It's just gone behind the tree. 
There we go. That is definitely a Batsalia, not a snake eagle. Hello, Monique. You want to know about the Unkuhumas and the hangers-on? Um, the other day, I saw the Unkuhumas with one of the young Mangeni males. He's looking in his fur is all back to normal. Um, a little bit mangy, but um, he's not looking in great condition with regards to his, his bones and his meat. Um, but he seems to have completely integrated into the pride. I was in the Mara during this whole sort of escapade of the lions. I haven't met the Telemati male. He wasn't with them the other day when I saw them. Seb, have you seen the Telemati with the Uncle Humas? Mm, yes, <coughs> when was that? Okay, just before I got back from leave, the Telemati male was with them, and there were two, there were at least two um, Mangeni males not so long ago. I've only seen one, and there's only one hanging out with the pride at the moment. The other one, don't know where he's gone. Um, I saw one when I, right when I got back from leave, or before I went on leave, should I say, at Vuetelepan, and he wasn't looking in great condition at all. The whole pride, in fact, the whole Unkuhuma pride is looking in the worst condition I've seen them since I've been here for over a year. They were looking in really good condition last year in January. And they're all looking a little bit scratchy, a little bit mangy at the moment, and are not as, as meaty and beefed up as lions should be looking at this time of year. It might have something to do with the mange that's been brought in, no doubt, by the Mangeni males. But it's something that lions can't avoid with the tactile communication that is so common with their species. They're all touchy-feely. Show me a cat that doesn't like to rub its head against something. And lions, well, they just love it. And it's a contracted disease through touch. Or the virus, the mite that transfers across is transferable. But these, this male is looking in great condition, apart from an empty belly. No doubt he can alleviate quite easily and quite quickly with a short, small meal. Who knows, folks? He might jump up now and catch himself some dinner. As I said, the temperatures are really pleasant right now. And being windy. Windy and cool is the best time of day to search for food if you're a lion. It's not the best time of day to search for animals, as Lauren can be testament. So no luck with our leopard tracks. They kind of took us around in a bit of a circle along some bumpy bumpy roads but we do have what i think is one of the coolest birds here there's actually more than one of them around and this is of course craig's favorite bird so this is a gray go away bird and it does make that really well-known call that sounds like the bird is saying go away that's probably a really really bad impression of it but it's a beautiful looking bird if not very 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 noisy so they do feed on uh, fruit also flowers and buds and even some invertebrates and nectar so quite a wide range there and there you go you can see the two of them together oh isn't that nice and they're very distinctive by that tuft of hair on the top of their head actually quite large birds but normally they're quite rare rare to see. They're very common around here, but normally you hear them more than you see them, is what I'm trying to say. We just thought we'd point these beautiful birds out to you. I was kind of hoping they might make their iconic call. Oh, no, the Woodland Kingfisher does it instead. So let's check out this undeniably beautiful sunset. Oh, there's the Woodland. Nice one, Craig. Although we can only see its back. This is a bird that called instead of the grey birds. Jennifer loves the birds. I'm not sure whether you're talking about the grey go away birds or the woodland kingfishers, but Jennifer, they are both really, really cool birds to have around. And I was actually saying the other day, I can't really remember what life was like without the woodland kingfisher around. It's just 
the call is from about 4 a.m. onwards. That's the most loudest sound that we hear out here. And I just can't remember what it was like when that sound wasn't around. So let's just check out. We'll give you a better view of the slowly setting sunset with all these clouds in the sky. It's actually going to be quite beautiful. Let's see if we can get a good view of this. How's that, Craig Moore? You can see what kind of night we have in store for us. Can you see the sun is slowly setting there with all those clouds? So I wonder if we are due some rain tonight. We were supposed to get a lot of rain coming our way that we were a little bit worried about, but it seems to have been diverted. So I wonder what is in store for us tonight. Isn't that beautiful? A sunset with a clear sky is beautiful, but a sunset with a cloudy sky is also equally beautiful. As you can see, we probably will lose light a little bit quicker. So we're going to continue on and see exactly what we can find before it gets too dark. I was actually having a conversation with Tristan last night about how I find it really difficult, me personally, to see in that sort of dusky and dawn light when it gets sort of the lights just coming or the lights just going before darkness sets and I find my eyes just don't work. And Tristan agreed, humans are not really designed to have peak eye performance in those sort of hours of the day. But yet animals are, we're just talking how fascinating it is that that is probably their peak time of day and yet for us, beautiful times of day but in terms of our eyes they're just not really designed to see well so it is coming to that time of day Okay, just having some Well, I'm terribly sorry. I'm not sure exactly what technical issues have transpired on that side, but we are still here with our very flat Voca male. He hasn't budged. There we go. He flicked his ear. Oops. There it is. All the fur inside the ear that we have learnt is to filter out and to absorb the sounds, almost like the fluffer we wear on our microphones or the fluffer that you might wear on a, um, on a microphone when singing or recording in a studio so as to prevent those funny sounds of breathing that come through. Not that I think the fluffer on my microphone prevents my breathing sounds, but that is the objective, is to sort of filter out the sounds that are coming to the line from all over the place. Otherwise, it's just a barrage of noises. So anybody out there through the identification that we saw of this male able to recognize exactly which one he is? I know he's not named at the moment, but I don't think he's the one that's been... Well, actually, I speak from correction. When I was with the mating pair around Chitwa not so long ago, this was the male with that scar on his lip that was with the female there. I remember that now. I remember taking a photo, in fact. Um, that scar on the lip is what I remember. So I think whoever was mating again has basically, you know, lions are not shy. Females will mate with consecutive males so as to ensure sort of um, fertilization of the egg, of the eggs, should I say. And well, on that note, what marvelous news up in the Mara. It seems like we might have some more babies or some more cubs 
in the sausage tree pride. I believe there might be four. Four new ones up there. I don't think James is able to get to them this afternoon due to the weather. But uh, no doubt that is going to be some amazing fun and games and joy and pleasure over the coming weeks. There is nothing more entertaining than new cubs because, well, they're full of energy. They're far more exciting than this male lion is. But uh, what can you do? We don't have too many other options right now. The concession is very quiet this evening. We're toying with the idea of maybe driving around, seeing if we can bump a leopard. It's a bit too late in the evening to start tracking, but it's also getting to that time when he might just get up and do something. Hello, Zebra. You want to know the biggest lion I've ever seen? Wow, that's a really good question. You know, I think, you know, the Mara lions, they seem to have a little bit more on them than these ones. Seb, what do you think? You know, I haven't measured them. I haven't seen them next to each other. But the Mara lions, the, the male lions up in the Mara are just enormous. I haven't been fortunate enough to, to meet or to, to find or see a Kalahari lion. Kalahari lions are regarded as the heaviest lions uh, due to their environment. And they have to take larger prey. Um, but I would say, which one would it be? Well, Kapuli is an enormous male. He really is a big, big male, but these evoker males are very impressive. It's really hard to say, Zebra. There are so many male lions in South Africa and up in Kenya, and well, unless you see them next to each other, it's very hard really to, to, to figure out a size. No doubt James Hendry would have an answer for you there. He's probably got a favorite lion. He's probably got one he reckons the biggest of them all. Uh, if I recall back in the day, the Mapojos that were down here in the Sabi Sands, I wouldn't say they were the biggest lions, but there was something about them that was just so incredibly scary. They had thick black manes. Their faces were torn to pieces. They didn't have noses that joined together. There were holes and scars and they were just a fierce really formidable looking bunch of males and i spent a little bit of time with them i know many of the viewers have spent time with them as well you know lots about the mapojos there's something about them that still sort of sort of chills my spine um the birmingham's that left not so long ago are a big bunch of boys and i think these evokers are not far behind them they might even be equivalent in size at the moment but to give you an exact number of who is the biggest really hard to say i'm afraid sorry i don't have an answer for you there but i've detailed all the males that we know i wasn't able to see scarface when i was up in the mara i wasn't able to encounter him at all i just kept missing him but he was still around by the time I left. I mean, we pins being dropped about him all the time, but I don't think he is the biggest male. Like Tingana, he's lost a bit of weight and a bit of size, and he's a bit more skin than he is fully built muscle. But no doubt, still a formidable adversary. You can possibly hear the black cuckoo in the background. I'm going to mimic him if you can't. mournful sound in the African bush in the summertime from one of the cuckoo species so it's basically saying I'm so sad and quite easy to remember oh we got another flick Seb we got another flick okay he's going to raise his head now you can just kind of feel it can't you can you feel it everybody three two one ah, well that was unexpected obviously he's not going to do anything right now something is going to jolt him to attention and then obviously we're going to have to move to reposition because um that is just the way it works doesn't it Don't forget, folks, we are live and interactive, coming to you from the Kruger National Park, Sabi Sands, in Druma Private Nature Reserve, private game reserve, should I say, with the Evoker Male, the unnamed Evoker Male for now. Your questions are most welcome, as are your comments. Has anyone 
Who is the biggest male lion you have seen, ladies and gentlemen? Send through your comments to hashtag Safari Live or just throw them in on the YouTube chat stream. No doubt some of you have got one that would ring out in your mind. No doubt there is a male or it's part of a coalition. Get your answers through now. Let's see if we can give Zebra the answer she wanted to know about who is the biggest of them all. And we'll ask James as well his opinion. I'm not getting any communications in my ear. So, possible that I have lost comms altogether. Okay, I am now getting communications. There we go. His head is up. And, well, while we wait to see what this beautiful male is going to do, and we wait for your answers, let's go see what Laura is up to. So we're back. I believe you lost me earlier because of signal breakup. And ahead of us, we um, is a Mwati, so there's a possibility we might lose signal again. So I'm just going to drive really, really closely, and FC can let me know if we start to break up. So I got asked a question before we broke up. Let's hear it again, and we'll go for it, since our luck with animals has not been fantastic today. It's very quiet out here. Maybe all the animals are full up on fish after last night's feast. So, FC, can we have the question again? So we're just going down into a little dip. I hope you don't lose me. I ever free dived with sharks. We're finally going to get an answer here. Yes, I am a free diver and I love it. It's my favorite thing to do. With sharks, no. Well, yeah, Atlantic reef sharks, but I have scuba dived with bull sharks and tiger sharks. They're really not as scary as you would think. Um, so yes, I've dived with no pain, but however, I have free dived with crocodiles, not Niles, like the one we have here. But I have free dive with saltwater crocodiles just on the Mexican border. They have this special place where you can go underwater with them. And you get prepped, you get told what's going to happen and how to handle yourself. I really love crocodiles. And they give you a stick, a wooden stick. That's all. That's all you have. And you're told that the stick is what you use in case the crocodiles get a little bit naughty. So as you can imagine, I was terrified, but it was a once in a lifetime experience. And of course I'm still here, so nothing bad happened, but crocodiles are indeed awesome. And when they're full, the reptiles, they really, they will just digest. They have no room in their tummy or reason to keep hunting and fill themselves up like other animals do. They will just stay quite calm and flat and they will not move at all. And it didn't help that one of the crocodiles was actually blind. So it couldn't even see my stick. So yes, awesome question there. <laughs> Sorry for the breakup earlier, I did start answering it, but yes, I have had lots of marine related experiences. Oh, maybe James can tell you about his diving in the Cayman. That was a definitely interesting underwater experience, but for now over to him to see what he has. Right, sorry everybody, we have been very absent for quite a while. We've been driving home, communications between us and final control impossible. We've seen two jackals, we tried to show them to you, I'm afraid, but um, our comms went down. Now we have a toad of some description, sitting on the side of the road. No idea what kind of toad it is, especially not as we, or especially as we cannot see its colours. But I'm glad we were able to contribute well something to the cause here a toad on the side of the road a hopping toad very good it's good at hopping right oh we can't do this thing in the way no still it's not going to help you 
All right, let me try and shift the car slightly. We have been driving with the windscreen up because of the rain. We'll put it down now. Oh, rain seems actually to have stopped slightly, so we'll keep going. It was a very, very bad decision on my part to come down this far south. We could probably have been sitting with the Olololo Pride the whole afternoon. Possibly even that hyena and her two cubs. Well, one takes chances and this is what happens, really. The thing about taking a gamble is that people like me, if you take a gamble, you're unable to compute the fact that the odds are against you and that means, therefore, that it's very unlikely that you're going to get what you want to get. And so, and yet someone like me is always surprised when the gamble doesn't pay off. When, of course, the mathematics says that it really shouldn't. Anyway, let's see if we can't find one or two other things for you. Um, this big bump, slide off the road. It's a lot of fun. Oh, my door opened. It's inconvenient. <laughs> How can we be used to driving without doors? All right, Lauren, Arthur, doing a far, far better job than I am this afternoon. Let's go across to her. Back so soon, and I'm not the only one free diving here. Look, we have a huge, huge herd of buffalo here right in the dam this is one of the largest herds of buffalo i have seen in a very long time and this is another area that stimulates your olfactory senses not quite in the way that the fish did at chitwa but buffalo definitely have a hmm, lovely strong earthy scent to them hello guys Oh, this is wonderful, just seeing them all drinking and fighting and splashing around. Buffalo don't generally appear to be the happiest of animals, but you can really see they're enjoying being here in the water. And of course, they're heavily dependent on water. Buffalo tend to travel from water point to water point and they drink daily. Not all animals out here have to drink daily, but buffaloes do. And they may drink up to about mm, 35 litres of water at a time. Heavily, heavily dependent on water. And of course, not just to drink in the heat of the day, they will enjoy just wallowing. Can you hear them splashing around? Hope you can hear that. There's lots of splashing. You can just hear them all walking along through the water. And there's lots of young ones in this hair, just breeding hair. Oh, this is just wonderful. Gone a little while with no animals, and we're back with the huge herd. Oh, FC just confirmed you can hear the sound. Oh, it's lovely. Just as the sun is setting, we come across this huge mixed herd of buffalo. Now, of course, just like the hippos we saw at the start of the drive, buffaloes do have a bit of a reputation out here for being slightly aggressive and formidable. And of course they can be, but this is just delightful seeing them all like this. Hello. <laughs> Lots of splashing going on. And many of them have fox peppers on their back as well. So many of them are getting cleaned a little bit as well. Red-billed fox peppers. So this is actually why we were traveling from water hole to water hole to see animals bathing and drinking and we finally came across them just in time. Now females, they're just moderately 
sort of, I don't know, mildly sexually dimorphic. It isn't too easy to tell the difference between males and females. It's a lot more trickier than some animals. But the females do tend to be a little bit more ruddy brown in colour. So you can see there is a different... just got it here if see just pointed out that wound ouch so this brings up a really unique topic you can see here there's a there's a bite quite a wound and a little stump of a tail <laughs> the tail's obviously been um bitten off i would imagine and you can see that it is still moving and that looks rather painful now ox peckers are a really hot topic at the moment because it's been thought of for years that they are assisting the animals that they perch upon they are mutually symbiotic so you know they will take away the ticks and the animal will be clean and the animal will be happy and the animal will keep the ox pecker safe however there's been a lot of discussion hot topic that ox pickers may not be all they seem so we just saw that buffalo with the wound i'm not sure if it's just one yeah it's one dog off might have lost it and we saw the ox pecker right in that wound now the discussion centers around the fact that ox pickers are said not to actually remove that many ticks so they don't really facilitate the removal of the tick load of course they remove some but in comparison to the volume of ticks that is on an animal in general, they're not said to make too much of a difference. They are said to go for the little holes that larger ticks leave on animals and drink the blood and they tend to keep wounds open. So if an animal does have a big wound like that, that buffalo did just there, the ox pecker is said to keep it open and not let it heal, which can of course lead to infections. So there's two sides to this story. There's a lot of people for this argument and against this argument, but it's a very interesting topic. <laughs> oh, Jennifer, that's what I was just about to say, yes. So people are thinking there's, there's a lot of science centering around the fact that ox peckers might actually be vampire birds you took the words right out of my mouth jennifer so i'm not sure where i sit with it i'm continuing to research it i do believe of course they do eat the ticks but yes there is a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that mm, they don't always assist these animals in the positive manner that we hope they do and some animals really get annoyed by their presence. You can really see they're irritated by having these birds on them. Whereas these buffaloes look generally quite like they couldn't care less, to be honest. But I would be interested to see how the science develops on this with the ox peckers. But seeing that wound there on that buffalo was a perfect example and that's exactly what the ox pecker was doing, pecking right into the wound, which I imagine would be really, really painful. But the, the stump of the tail that we saw, that was a little bit creepy, that that's obviously healed. I imagine that's been bitten off and it's obviously sort of closed up and healed in a way. It just seemed to be the injury on the back left hip region, if you like. So I wonder how that buffalo got that. What did you do? So we may stay with these buffaloes. <laughs> I love the face they're pulling. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? We may stay with them a little bit longer because it's such a glorious sight. But let's send you over to James now with a giraffe. Hi, sorry, I think you've lied with us, everybody. Our comms are an absolute nightmare today. I'm sorry about that. We had some giraffes in the infrared, but I'm afraid they moved outside of the, the rays. 
The rain continues to fall. Uh, we did see a serval as well, couldn't get it on camera, it ran away. And so really, we're not having the best luck today. This is what you get for gambling. Let that be a lesson to all gamblers. Well, there's some more giraffe, we might try them. Wongay, okay, do you think you can see those things? Are they too far away? I don't want to shine the light on them, everybody. We're just going to see if we can get them in infrared. They're uh, just over there. <laughs> you, know, you want me to move the car? Okay, fair enough. I can do that. That I can do. Like so. Yes? What a lovely cloud of diesel we've just made. Oh, I've just inhaled the entire thing. How beautiful. Oh. <coughs> and the giraffe are out of our range. Everybody, this is a superb example of how not to take a live night game drive. We're doing a superb job of that. And so if you ever find yourself trying to take a live night game drive in the rain, this is how not to do it. And we may well be stuck now. No, 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 we've got out. That's a good thing. Whew. Sorry about that. I am going to have to pick up, I'm afraid, this windscreen. Stefan, I don't think this is going to work, I'm afraid. I'm sorry about that. The rain is just too much now. So let's go back across to Steve. Sorry about that, everybody. Welcome back and uh, well the buffalo are on the property uh, I think maybe we should tell this young gentleman there are buffalo just up the road he moved his ear mm -hmm. he's definitely hungry folks he's definitely hungry well anyway while we're waiting for this male lion to do something other than just flick his ear it was Tuesday yesterday as you probably are all familiar seeing as it is Wednesday today it can be nothing else other than Tuesday yesterday and well as we you know we like to do a game called tracking Tuesdays on Instagram on Safari Live uh, official on Instagram if you have not checked it out before you should check it out every Tuesday because it is a wonderful way of honing your tracking skills so I'm just gonna have one more look at him he's doing nothing let's have a look at my phone over here shall we and there we go hashtag tracking Tuesdays and just move that in a way now folks you can have a look at this now it is definitely what seems to be a scrape mark on the ground doesn't it but at first glance you think maybe it's a Steenbock scratching and digging don't you you think maybe Steenbock or something like that but bearing in mind folks that that leather man in the middle there is 10 centimeters now a Steenbock is probably about two and a half centimeters wide that track uh, so that would be minuscule in comparison minuscule in comparison so that is a huge track on the side there now there are two of them you can see there's definitely some form of digging here and scratching all the way forward some people have thought maybe warthog tusking the ground well not a bad sort of idea maybe a warthog tusk but once again you look at the size of that track sorry Seb I'll let you do the movements let me just make it a bit smaller again you see the size of the track there so it's not a warthog tusk warthog tusks are quite narrow and if anything maybe as wide as the leather man is over there so if you can see that the track is much wider than that of the leather man so warthog tusk definitely not a bad guess I think someone said a tortoise um, very very wide for a tortoise would be the probably one of the world's biggest tortoises and they don't have a four-wheel drive spinning action to dig in the ground like that okay so the only other animal it possibly could be and it's a really really good track uh, joy no it is definitely not a steenbok steenbok indeed makes this kind of digging that you can see but this is actually probably two different events of an animal lying down and you can see that it doesn't end very well over there it just ends abruptly uh, a steenbok you'll actually see the hoof mark moving down here and often into a pile there'll be a little pile of something over here so a little bit of a of a difficult one um, for those of you who've never seen one of these before when I first opened the page I thought ah Steenbock but looking at the size of that leather man 10 centimeters folks 10 centimeters is the size of of my fingers all the way from my fingers to the middle of my hand over there that's 10 centimeters so think about that that is huge 
that is a huge, huge track. So this is indeed the tusk mark of an elephant, the tusk of an elephant in the ground, and most likely it went this way. It went from this way to that way in the ground. Maybe this animal was lying down. Um, sometimes they will dig in the ground, they'll scratch in the ground with their tusks uh, to, to, to loosen it, to then pick up the mud and throw it on the head. But all in all, a really, really good track. And for those of you who didn't get it right, don't worry. We've got next Tuesday to continue wowing yourself with the wonders of Tracking Tuesday. And keep your questions and comments coming through. Keep honing those those skills to make sure that you, you're just keeping up with it. But if you got it wrong, don't worry, it's not wrong. It's just one more lesson in all the tracking that you've been um, shown over the show. And I think Tristan took the photos. It's a really nice photo to see in the mud like that. So a really nice track. And uh, well, let's go back over to our now upside down male lion, who was not at all interested in the tracking Tuesdays. Tristan did indeed take the photo. So that is sort of when you see a tusk mark on the ground, it's got a very smooth sort of shine to it, which that bottom of that track had a very smooth sort of shine. Uh, a hoof mark would definitely leave a proper scraping with an edge to it. It wouldn't be a smooth sort of movement. If you take a sharp round stick and you dig it in the ground, that's the kind of mark an elephant tusk would do. So well done. A number of you did get it right. Uh, someone even asked specifically if it was fang. And well, I can't tell you that for sure, but the, the shape of it and the way that those two are positioned, it possibly could be. I really don't know. But normally elephant's tusks will go down on the side of the face. And sometimes you can actually find not only feet in the air, but buffalo doing something quite similar. But when they make the mud, when they make the horning in the mud, it doesn't look the same as an elephant tusk. There's no way we could leave this sighting. This is just too magical. They're all in the water. Now, when we first approached here, there was some quite hesitant ones up on the bank. Um, water holes are always, I personally feel that some animals get nervous around water holes. Um, potentially, maybe there could be a lot of threats in the water. They maybe think there's crocodiles. Now, we know there's not in this one, but I think animals have a sense that if they go too close to the water holes, it could mean danger for them and i touched on the male and female element earlier but i didn't get a i don't know i must have got distracted so a lot of textbooks and whatnot will tell you that the females are a slightly different color maybe a lighter reddish brown i i struggle to see this sometimes and the younger ones are definitely a little bit lighter but in the adults it isn't always easy to just go by color i wouldn't say and especially in the fact that they do often get mud stuck on them and they often look a little bit darker so it's best just to look at their horns and their bosses so females tend to have much smaller bosses that's the middle part on the head and thinner smaller horns compared to males who have this huge Boss. It almost looks like it's a wig or a hairpiece sitting on top. There we go, Clay. And this is, of course, because they fight and they clash horns and they clash bosses. Yes, that's it. perfect. I'm not sure if you were able to see the difference there, but I think it's a much easier te technique to look at the horns and the bosses than it is to sort of look at the colour. So I was mentioning earlier the Highland cows, or should I say Highland coos, not too different from the buffalo. So I'm going to show you in case some of you are thinking, what on earth is a Scottish lady talking about? So here, this is a Highland cow found in Scotland. <laughs> very cute, very adorable, not like your average looking cow, but also very formidable and oh, they do have a bit of a temper problem as well. So you have to watch out for the Highland cows, just like these buffalo behind me. So I thought that tied in nice and perfectly. Now, I don't even know how many buffaloes are actually here. I'm terrible at estimating numbers. What would you say, Craig? Craig also doesn't know. Yeah. Um, Probably higher than 50. And you wonder where were they all day? We've driven quite a lot today, round and round, and where were you guys? 
Now, the thing with buffaloes... Oh, everyone loves the Highland cow. I'm good. Some of you, I'm sure, are aware exactly what it is, but I'm sure some of you weren't. So there you go, a Highland cow or a Highland coo, if you want to say it in the Scottish accent. So normally when you find buffaloes around, you know that the lions will be onto them. Lions do tend to sort of follow buffaloes. Oh. A little splash there. Lions do tend to follow buffaloes around. As I mentioned, they do smell. So lions are very aware of that scent and are often found trailing behind buffalo. Not always, but we do know there's lions around. Steve's been with them today. So I wonder what will happen tonight. There may be an attempt of a buffalo hunt. So there is a beautiful sunset setting upon us, but let's go over to Steve who can show you that one. Welcome from the Buffalo to a beautiful, a beautiful sky. We are still with our male lion. Sorry about the pole there, folks. We've had our roof on in expectation of flooding rain, fail, uh, hail storms that are scheduled two days ago, still haven't emerged, but um, we arrived. We are just watching the beautiful sky as obviously the colors of the sun move through the atmosphere. There's really beautiful skies in the summer months. It is a beautiful sunset indeed, folks. And well, the lion is still lying flat on his back, enjoying a little bit of a breeze over his belly as well, we enjoy a moment of silence coming towards the end of the show. Such marvelous, spectacular views. Just going to keep quiet for a moment and let the ambience sort of rain in or soak into everybody, wherever you might be. like these one should just take a deep breath and just enjoy <coughs> excuse me as the wind picks up I'm keeping my eye closely on the male line to see if he is going to get interested in moving north Excuse me, I've got a bit of a tickle in my throat. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. So a little bit of a throat pain the last couple of days, but all is well. A little bit of a tickle, all is good. As we watch the final rays of the sun, what a marvelous afternoon it has been. It is so green here in Juma. So much water has fallen. <coughs> Excuse me, I do apologize for my throat. I would get a new one if I could. Beautiful reds. Grays. What other color can you see there, Seb? A little bit of purple. Pinks. Blue. Orange. Orange. See how windy it is still. <coughs> I do apologize. And as the final moments of the show draw to a close, wouldn't it be a fantastic way to end the show if our male lion decided to jump up and do something spectacular? Last minute action scene from the Evoker male. It could happen. It really, really could. I'm going to put you back on him now because, well, Move up just a touch there, Seth. Just a touch so we can see his face. One last view of the male lion as we get ready to say goodbye. And there he sits. 
leg raise in the air. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this sunset safari. For James and the Mara, I hope you don't get too wet. Lauren, thanks for everything as well. All the questions and comments. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow.